Hello, I'm Mike Paul from the DNA Learning Center. And today we're going to talk a little bit about enzymes. Um, now, before we talk all about just enzymes in general, we're specifically going to be talking about enzymes from the liver, right? So our liver is an organ that detoxifies things. And the way that it detoxifies things is through enzymes, right? So it breaks things down and it uses enzymes to break things down. So today we are going to um, use the liver to break down hydrogen peroxide. So before we do that, I just wanna share my screen for a little bit and I wanna kinda of get into this and talk a little bit about enzymes. All right, so we call this lab a kitchen science lab because kitchen science, it's just basically saying something that you can do from your kitchen. All the things that we're using here today are household items that you could definitely use from, uh, that you can have in your kitchen. Now, I wanna jump right in and just start talking about some characteristics of enzymes. So enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. And you might see that and you might think to yourself like, well, what does that mean? And we're gonna talk a little bit about what that means uh, in a second. Now, enzymes are affected by changes in pH and temperature. Enzymes only fit specific substrates. Um, we're gonna talk about this as well, but basically what it means is one enzyme will only really catalyze a specific type of chemical reaction. It's not going to, uh, just you know, work for all chemical reactions. It only works for a very specific type of chemical reaction. Um, enzymes are proteins, which is important because this is how it ties back into the DNA learning center, right? Proteins are coded for in our DNA. Um, so enzymes are coded for in our DNA, which is kind of awesome. Typically, when we're naming enzymes, they end in ACE. So typically they end in ACE. Uh, I say typically because there are some enzymes that don't end in ACE. They might end in uh, you know, a number. Um, like restriction enzymes, they end in numbers, but enzymes, for the most part, they end in ACE. Uh, during reactions, like during the chemical reaction, the enzyme will remain unchanged. So this is really important to remember. The enzyme will remain unchanged. So that means the enzyme can be reused. So that's important. All right, now, let's move on a little bit, and let's figure out what I, I'm talking about when I say, first of all, what is a substrate and what, what is kind of going on here. So if you look at this, the enzyme is fitting directly with its substrate. They, they, they match shapes, it's kind of like a lock and a key, right? So the enzyme and the substrate, they are shaped in order to kind of go together. When you denature an enzyme, you're changing the shape of the enzyme. So you see how this shape right here, it matches the substrate perfectly. If I change the temperature, I change the pH, I raise the temperature, I lower the pH, or I increase the pH, I can change the shape of the enzyme. And this enzyme will no longer fit that substrate, which means that that enzyme will no longer work. So that enzyme is not going to work anymore. All right, so changes in temperature and pH will denature the enzyme, which will cause the enzyme to no longer fit the substrate, which essentially means the enzyme will no longer work. Now. What does it really mean to have the enzyme work? So we always say enzymes catalyze chemical reactions, but let's actually dive in a little bit to what that means. So first things first, we're just gonna look at this. Chemical reactions, they require a certain amount of energy input in order to happen. And this energy input is called the activation energy. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about it, right? Like it's the energy required to activate a chemical reaction and therefore we call it the activation energy. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Now, enzymes will lower this activation energy. And that's what's interesting. They offer a different energetic pathway um, that allows the activation energy to be lower. So it's essentially like the energetic cost of the reaction is less when there's an enzyme present or a catalyst present. Now, enzymes are catalysts, which is an interesting thing. And you might hear me kind of uh, interchange those as I'm, I'm, as I'm teaching this lab. But remember, enzymes are catalysts, but not all catalysts are enzymes. There are some non-biological catalysts out there. Um, but enzymes are catalysts. Um, and enzymes and catalysts, they lower the activation energy, right? So they're not affecting the energetic states of the reactants or the energetic states of the products. They're just affecting the activation energy. And we're gonna get into exactly what I'm talking about with this later, because you know, when we're talking about energy and we're talking about chemical reactions, you might be thinking to yourself like, oh, there's a lot of different energies going on, right? And, and that's definitely true, but chemical reactions typically have like an overall change in energy. And what this really means is, you know, the, the overall energy, when you're looking at it from like the, the universal standpoint, if you're, if you're taking a step back and you're looking at it 
in the guise of, of the entire universe, the energy is going to remain the same. It might change form, but, but it's going to remain the same. But if you start zooming in, you look at specifically just one energetic system containing a chemical reaction, the energy might be a little different, right? So what we're gonna look at is the energy in that individual energetic system of the chemical reaction, and we're gonna think about how energy is entering or exiting that system. And it's generally happening through heat. So heat being released or heat being taken in. Now, a portion of the energy associated with the chemical reaction, there's several different portions of energies that can be associated with the chemical reaction, but one is called enthalpy. And the change in enthalpy is a, is a really important, uh, it's an important measurement because really uh, the change in enthalpy will tell you kind of where the heat is going. So if the change in enthalpy is negative, the reaction is considered exothermic. And you know, that's all well and good, right? If you, if you say exothermic, that's, you're gonna sound smart and you're gonna be able to talk to people and, and sound like you're really intelligent, but you gotta actually know what that means. So exothermic, when I look at that prefix, exo, my mind goes to exoskeletons, right? So my mind just jumps immediately to exoskeletons. And an exoskeleton is really just kind of like the skeleton on the outside of the bug or whatever organism you're looking at, an exoskeleton is the skeleton on the outside of it. So exo really means release or, or kind of like the outside. So an exothermic reaction releases heat. So the system, the energetic system in, it is releasing heat into the outside, all right? If the change in enthalpy is positive, the reaction is considered endothermic. Now, we might not be as familiar with the term, uh, the prefix endo, but essentially what it's saying is it's going to take heat from the outside into the energetic system of the chemical reaction. So heat is being brought into that chemical reaction. So exothermic heat's released, endothermic heat is being brought in. It's very important. All right, so this brings us to our first reaction diagram. And, and if you look at the reaction diagram, you might be a little intimidated by it, if you're intimidated by this, just don't be, because we'll, we'll break it down and, and we'll, get kind of, we'll get into it a little bit. Uh, I was really intimidated the first time I saw one of these things, and uh, I just remember it being a little, little scary. And then you know, we broke it down and it becomes a little more digestible. Um, and that is not an intentional enzyme pun, the digestible right there. All right, so if you look at the y-axis right here, we have energy. So energy will be increasing in this direction. And then we have reaction progress down here, and that's kind of increasing over there. Reaction progress can be considered time, um, but we don't really want to put a, if, for these types of diagrams, we don't want to have to have a scale on the bottom, the scale of time. We don't want to usually have any form of scale because the kinetics can kind of change, and this is really just a purely thermodynamic picture right here. Um, so right here, I have the energetic state of the reactants, and right here, I have the energetic state of the products. So the first thing I'm noticing is the reactants have a lower energetic state than the products, right? So that's the first thing I'm noticing. Um, now, when I'm looking at this, I might think the, the energetic pathway to get from reactants to the products should just be that, right? It should just be a straight line from the reactants. I know I can't draw that well, so that isn't exactly a straight line, but it should be just a straight line from the reactants to the products, but it isn't. And initially, when you, when you learn that, you, you might think that doesn't make any sense, but when you think about it for a second, it would make a lot of sense that the transition state, this state up here, would have a very high energy associated with it. So when the reactants are turning from the reactants into the products, they have to go through this thing called the transition state. And a transition state, you can kind of think of it as just the molecules are in a very unstable position. They, they're really unhappy in, in a geometric kind of alignment. They're in a really unhappy geometric alignment up there. So it's really unstable. So in order to, when, when you say unstable in the world of chemistry or the world of physics, what you're really talking about is it has a high energy associated with it, right? So it's pretty unstable. Um, so it goes from the reactants. If it's uncatalyzed, it goes all the way up here. There, there's what the energy required uh, to get the reaction going. And then it falls down. Now, the energy required to get the reaction going is called the activation energy, EA, activation energy. That's the energy required to activate the chemical reaction. You can see it goes from here all the way up to there. And that's that activation energy, right? Now, 
That's the activation energy for an uncatalyzed chemical reaction. If I add a catalyst, you see this dotted line right here? That dotted line is indicating the energetic pathway if this is a catalyzed chemical reaction. So if this is catalyzed, we have a different energetic pathway with a lower activation energy. So the activation energy for this one is lower. All right? Now, essentially what that means is the energetic cost for a catalyzed reaction is less. And what I'm saying with this, remember we talked about transition states and we talked about you know, uh, the stability of the transition state based on the geometric shape. What the catalyst is doing is it's essentially making that transition state no longer as unstable. So it's not as unstable as it, as it uh, could be because the catalyst is kind of making it a little bit uh, you know, a little bit more energetically favorable to be in that area. So it's lowering the activation energy through that. One thing I want you guys to notice, though, is just, you know, the, the, the energetic state of the reactions, uh, reactants and the energetic state of the products, they are remaining the exact same. So that's, that's important to remember. No matter what happens, the reactants and products, the energy states there will remain unchanged. All right. The other thing I want you guys to notice is it's kind of circled in red on this slide. Um, the delta H is greater than zero. Delta H, that might seem a little intimidating. Once again, we're in, a, we're in another setting where we're kind of seeing an unfamiliar thing. It might seem a little intimidating. Delta in science typically just means change, right? H is how we define enthalpy. So what I'm saying here is the change in enthalpy is greater than zero. The change in enthalpy is greater than zero. And what this means, if we go back to this slide, the change in enthalpy is greater than zero, which means the change in enthalpy is positive, then the reaction is considered endothermic. All right, so this is an endothermic reaction. And what that means is it's taking heat from the outside of the system and bringing it into the system. All right, now that's great, but let's look at another reaction diagram. Right here, the first thing you're noticing is the thing that's circled in red, right? The, the delta H, or the change in enthalpy, is less than zero, which means the change in enthalpy is negative. And if we remember, we go back in time, the change in enthalpy is negative. The reaction is considered exothermic. So this reaction is exothermic. Now let's just take another look at this, just because you know we only really looked at one reaction diagram, so let's break this one down as well. We're looking at energy increasing in this direction. We're looking at time right here. We don't have a scale for time, but it's just kind of a general time is increasing that way. We have our reactants right here. We have our products down there. Those are the energies associated with that. Then to get from reactants to products, you can see the energetic pathway happening right there. The activation energy from this reaction is going to go from here the energetic state of the reactants up to the peak of the activation uh, of the transition state energy. So that is the activation energy for this reaction. Now, this is a cool reaction, right? And it's uncatalyzed at the moment. But let's add a catalyst. Let's say if, if there is a catalyst, I don't have an actual catalyst for this you know, theoretical reaction to tell you what the catalyst actually is, but Let's just say some theoretical catalyst comes into this theoretical reaction. What's going to happen to the energetic pathways? Remember, the reactants are going to remain the same. The energetic state of the reactants will remain right where it is. I'm just kind of drawing a dotted line here. And the energetic state of the products will remain the same. The only thing that will change is the new activation energy is going to be less than the original of act uh, activation energy was, all right? So remember, that activation energy is lowered. That's what catalysts do. That's what enzymes do. They lower the activation energy of a chemical reaction. All right, so I'm showing you guys a reaction right here that it seems pretty simple, right? H2O2 going to H2O and O2. Now, you might be looking at this and you might actually know what all these chemicals are, right? You might, you might know H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide, H2O is water, and O2 is oxygen. And you might be thinking to yourself, hey, Mike, 
or Mr. Paul, whatever you want to, whatever you want to think of it as, but um, you might look at this and you might kind of think, you know, I have hydrogen peroxide at my house and it doesn't just randomly break into water and oxygen. It will stay hydrogen peroxide for a long time. And that is because the activation energy, the activation energy required to go from H2O2 to H2O plus O2 is pretty high. So without a catalyst, H2O2 will remain H2O2. In you know, most senses, you, you can kind of add energy to the system in other ways to get it to change. Um, you know, if, you, if you burn it, it will probably break down. But at room temperature, standard pressure, what's going to happen is this will remain H2O2. So hydrogen peroxide, is a byproduct in a lot of our reactions that are happening in our body. So it, it's, a, it's a product that is happening, it, it's being generated all the time in our body. So our liver needs to be able to deal with it because H2O2 is fairly toxic, right? You use it to disinfect your cuts and, and things along those lines, but what it will do to your cells is it will break your cells down as well. So you need to be able to break H2O2 down. And our livers, have a specific enzyme called catalase. And catalase will break H2O2 into H2O and O2 by lowering the activation energy of this reaction. So in order to get this reaction to happen, we add catalase. Catalase. Now, again, you might be looking at this chemical reaction and you're thinking to yourself, Mike, what is going on here? The numbers don't match, right? H2O2, we have two hydrogens and two oxygens. Then on the other side of it, we have two hydrogens and three oxygens. That's not good. So let's just balance this chemical reaction really quickly. You throw a two in front of the H2O2, you throw a two in front of the H2O, and we're good, right? Now we have four hydrogens and four oxygens over here. And once again, four hydrogens and four oxygens right here. So now we're golden. Um, and let's actually look at this chemical reaction. Let's see what the energetic pathway of this chemical reaction will be, right? Because as of right now, we're just looking at you know, a line. We have to see what is going on and we have to put it in the, you know, in the lens of all the things that we have already seen. So let's move forward and here we go. Now we have H2O2 right over here. These are our reactants and right here we have our products. So. What you'll notice is you have initially without, so this red line is indicating the reaction with catalase or the reaction with the catalyst or the reaction with the enzyme. And this black line is indicating the reaction without catalase. So this is the uncatalyzed reaction, this is the catalyzed reaction. So if you look at the differences in activation energy, you'll notice that activation energy, we'll call that activation energy one, is pretty large, whereas activation energy two is fairly small. And really that is the difference that we're doing. We're offering a different energetic pathway. The, the, the states, the energy states of you know, H2O2 and H2O and O2 are gonna remain the same. We're just offering a different way of getting there. Um, we're just making it a little bit easier to go from one to the other by adding catalase. Um, one thing I want you guys to notice, the energetic state of H2O2 is higher than the energetic state of H2O and O2. Now, this translates into this reaction having a delta H that is less than zero. So the delta H is less than zero. Delta H less than zero. So if we go back to here, if the change in enthalpy is negative, or if the change in enthalpy or the delta H is less than zero, the reaction is considered exothermic. So what this means is this reaction that we're looking at, this hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen, is going to release heat. So that's another really fun way that we can kind of tell that this reaction is happening. We're gonna get into kind of what are all the ways that we can tell that this reaction is actually going on right now. And first things first, what we're going to do is we need to get a, you know, initial temperature reading. So right here I have a thermometer and I am just going to take the thermometer and put it into my hydrogen peroxide. Let's just get a reading of what temperature this hydrogen peroxide is. 
So I'll take this, I'll bring it over here. It's dropping down, but you know, it's around, I would say 20, 22 degrees Celsius. All right, so 22 degrees Celsius. Now, in science, we always like to use Celsius. I know a lot of people are familiar with Fahrenheit, but you know, we always like to use Celsius in science. It, it makes a lot, of, a lot more sense than Fahrenheit. You know, zero is the freezing point of water, 100 is the boiling point. It just makes a lot more sense, right? So initially, this temperature was 22 degrees Celsius. This is the hydrogen peroxide right here. I have my liver right here. What we're going to do is we're going to take this liver, and we're going to drop it into the hydrogen peroxide. All right, so let me just fold this, and we'll get the liver going in there. So drop the liver in, and if you take a look, almost instantly, this reaction starts happening, right? It starts bubbling, it starts going real fast. You can see the actual bubbles forming. You can see this whole thing happening. Now, one way that I'm going to be able to tell if this reaction happens is a couple ways. One way is the temperature is going to increase, and that'll tell me that the, the reaction is occurring. But another and frankly more fun way is through fire, right? Because one of the products of this reaction is oxygen. So oxygen is a very flammable gas. And let's actually put that to the test. Let's see if oxygen is being created. Get my burner going. I'll take my popsicle stick. I'll light it on fire. Now, in this uh, experiment, this is something that you guys can do from home. But just, you know, when you're lighting things on fire, make sure your, your parents are there and make sure that they kind of know what you're doing. So I blow it out, and we see it's kind of smoking right now. Let's see if this will go back on fire when I put that there here. So since it goes back on fire, we know that this oxygen is actually being created. So the oxygen is being created here. Now, a lot of people always ask me like, oh, Mike, what'll happen if I drop that in there? Will an explosion happen? And no, an explosion will not happen. Because remember, the other byproduct is water. So we have some oxygen gas, but then the other thing is water. So the bottom is turning into water while all these bubbles are oxygen. Now, let's see if my temperature changed yet. So we want to give it some time for the temperature to change, but let's just see what happens now. So if we look at my thermometer, remember the initial reading was 22 degrees Celsius. If we look at the thermometer and you see it's climbing up. We'll give it some time to really get to where it is. You're just watching it. And it's probably gonna get up to around 37 degrees Celsius, which is the human body temperature, which is really kind of like the best, uh, the, the best temperature for these enzymes to work, which is you know, not coincidental. This is in our body, so it makes sense that it will work best at around 37 degrees. So the temperature is getting up right around there. So that's pretty cool. So we know that the reaction works with just liver going into hydrogen peroxide, right? So we know that works. So earlier I told you enzymes will be affected by changes in temperature and changes in pH. The first thing, let's put temperature to the test. So right here I cooked some liver and uh, I just microwaved it. <laughs> the people that work with me are not too happy with me because of that. It smells pretty, pretty uh, pungent. Um, so we're gonna take some of this cooked liver and we'll just drop it on in there. So I'll just put it in my hand. We'll drop it right into this hydrogen peroxide. But before I drop it into that hydrogen peroxide, let's get another temperature reading. Let's do it right. So the temperature of this is around, remember, it's still around 22 degrees Celsius, right? It's a little bit, a little bit lower right now, but it's around 22 degrees. So remember, there's two ways that we can tell if this reaction is working or not. The first way is going to be the temperature change, but the second way is our bubbles being created and is it flammable? So I dropped that in there. I dropped the cooked liver in there. And there's a couple bubbles, but that's just because of the, you know, me dropping it in there. But nope, no bubbles are being formed. But let's see if it's flammable. You never know, right? It's always kind of, kind of fun to light things on fire. So let's let's see what happens. So light this on fire. Get that. 
right here, we'll light the stick on fire. Got it kind of smoldering. We'll put it near here to see if anything happens. Nope, just instantly goes out. So we know that no oxygen is being created. So this is not, um, it's, the reaction is not happening, which means that these enzymes, the catalase in here, has been denatured. But let's do the other test and let's see if the temperature increases at all. So we'll take that in there. Let's take a look. Remember, the initial reading was around 22 degrees Celsius. Let's give it time to kind of get to where it needs to go. And no, the temperature is basically staying the same. Right? It's around 21.7, you know, approximately 22 degrees Celsius still. So when you cook the liver, increase the temperature, you denature the enzyme, which means that reaction doesn't work. But what about a change in pH? So Right here, I have a vat of acetic acid. Now, that's one kind of cool way to, to think of it. But another really interesting way of saying that you have a vat of acetic acid is you have a cup with some, uh, some vinegar in there. Uh, so this is just a cup with some vinegar in it, um, or a vat of acetic acid if you want to be cool. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that liver out of the acetic acid and put it into the hydrogen peroxide. And we're going to see, does a low pH or an acidic pH affect the enzyme as well? So before we do that, once again, let's be good scientists. Let's take the temperature reading initially. Take the initial temperature reading. You can see it's, once again, it's around like 21.7, 21.8. It's almost like 22 degrees Celsius. We'll just let it climb up there. So it's climbing up, getting up there. Now let's take this, take out this Take this liver right out of here. And drop it on in. So I drop it in, and we'll look at it initially. There is no reaction happening, right? So there's no visible reaction happening. But let's do our first test. Let's do the very first test, which is the fire test, right? If, if oxygen is being created, it will be flammable. So let's see. I light my popsicle stick on fire. Blow it out, and then we'll take it right in there. Nothing happened, right? Nothing happened at all. All right, so there's one test. Let's do the other test. Let's see if the temperature increases at all. Thermometer into the hydrogen peroxide. And you'll see, I don't know if you guys can see because it's a little glary, but it's around the exact same. Remember, it's 22 degrees Celsius and it's staying right about there, 21.9, 22. So temperature remains the exact same for this one. Now, before we're, we're, we finish up here, let's go back and let's think about this for a second. So the first cup, the first cup where all that hydrogen peroxide is being broken down, the reaction's kind of stopped. Right, so the reaction has now officially stopped. If you're wondering, where do I get these livers? This is not human liver, this is a chicken liver. Uh, I got it from Stop and Shop, so right over here. I have my chicken livers from Stop and Shop. And, you know, some people always ask, well, Mike, if, you, if the reaction stops, what happens if you add more liver? So let's add a little bit more liver. Let's see what happens. Let's put this to the test. If I add more liver, I right, have some liver right here. I just drop it in. There was no change. So there was no change to adding more catalase. Right, so I added more catalase, there's no change to the cup. Why might that be? The reason that is, is really because, remember, the, the, the catalase will be reusable. So essentially, if I add more catalase, it's not going to break down more hydrogen peroxide. All the hydrogen peroxide, once that reaction stopped, the hydrogen peroxide had all been broken down into H2O and O2. So I added more liver and nothing happened. What do you think will happen if I add more hydrogen peroxide? So I have some hydrogen peroxide right here. Just add a little bit more hydrogen peroxide. 
We'll just add a little bit more. Why not? You look at it, that reaction's happening, and it's kind of violent, so I'm just gonna put it right down in that way boat, and we'll watch those bubbles overflow. It's kind of cool, right? So the enzymes can be reused, and the hydrogen peroxide uh, will be broken down by the enzyme. All right, so that's bubbling liver. Um, you guys can do this at home. Just you know, make sure that you t t check with your parents before you make a huge mess and you get livers everywhere. Uh, also, just you know, before you light anything on fire ever, make sure you have a parent there. And probably just just don't do it in the first place. But it's kind of fun, especially with science. All right, thank you.